my mic up? Yep, sounds like it. Awesome. So, like you said, I'm here to talk to you about incident response. And specifically, I want to talk to you about a pattern I've noticed, which is an overdependency on playbooks as incident instruction manuals and how it causes our responders and our responses to suffer. So I want to just start by kind of gauging the room. Can you raise your hand if you've ever been on call or involved in responding to incidents? OK. <laughs> um, keep your hand up if you like being on call. It's a lot less hands. Is anyone on call right now? <laughs> I thought there might be a few. Um, I've been on call a lot. So hello again. I'm Ashley. Um, I have been on call for the better part of the last decade for things like production outages, security issues, even sensitive or politically charged brand issues and COVID-19 response. Um, I've been in a lot of incidents. And just a little bit about me while we're getting started. I live in Canada's beautiful capital city, Ottawa. It gets really cold. Uh, if you can handle an Ottawa winter, you will have no problem handling an incident. I live with my family. My husband and my seven-year-old son, Bowie, who's dressed as a banana in the slide. And I work with an awesome team of people at Rootley. We are kind of a band of former on-callers and incident responders that you can see in that photo there. And we're trying to improve the experience of incident response and on-call through our platform. I just happen to have the coolest job at Rootley, which is leading developer relations, which basically means I get to travel the world, come do talks like this, and meet people like you. Um, but a more hidden part of my job is that I also work with our customers, like NVIDIA, Figma, Elastic, and I help them build out their incident response programs as kind of an in-house consultant. So I've seen a lot of incident response programs be born and evolve. Um, and before all this, I worked at Shopify, where I spent about seven years building their incident response program from the ground up. So like I said, through all this work, I've noticed kind of a pattern. I'm going to call it an anti-pattern, which I know is kind of a cringy thought leadership word, but it kind of fits. Um, and this is what happens when companies are building out their incident response programs, and they actually over-index to the incident response plan or playbook as the key to successful incident response. I'm going to start by explaining this with kind of a generalized example of how I often see these programs begin and evolve, and what doesn't work, and what we can do instead. And one thing I want to stress here is when I talk about incident response, I mean the whole thing. Not just bringing the technical system back online, which is obviously really important, but all of the in-between of communication across teams, with customers, with stakeholders, all of that good stuff. So let me take you on a little journey of the origin of a typical incident response program. So at some point in every company's journey, they're going to have an incident. They might even have a bunch of them. And early on, it's going to feel really simple. If you're a small company, you kind of just get on a call and figure it out. But as their product and their organization matures, complexity will sneak up on them. Suddenly, people will feel frustrated, out of the loop, communication gets messy, people start disagreeing on the steps to take, and winging it just doesn't work anymore. And this is where it enters a character that I will call the Good Samaritan. They are usually someone who's been at the company for a long time. They're trusted in the org. They maybe hold a lot of historical context about how things work there. And they step up to solve the problem. It doesn't always happen like this, but it's usually some version of this. I was actually talking to one of our customers at Webflow just the other day about how their incident response program started off the side of their most experienced engineering manager's desk. And that's totally typical. A lot of the time, this isn't even somebody's full-time job. Early stage companies might not have the budget or even enough incidents to justify having a full-time role dedicated to incident response. Might be an engineer, an ops person, customer support. I've seen it spring up in all different parts of the org. And yes, this is exactly how I ended up with a career in incident response and ultimately on the stage. But whoever this person is, people are usually just happy that somebody is stepping up to tackle this hairy, complicated problem of incidents. So they get to work. What is an incident response plan anyways? Well, if they're anything like me, they will probably head straight to Google and try to figure it out. And Google will tell them something like this. An incident response plan is a set of instructions to help IT staff detect, respond to, and recover from service outages, 
blah, blah, blah. You get the slide. Uh, they'll find a ton of frameworks. There's a bunch of them that outline what incident response should look like. Uh, in my opinion, they're all kind of the same. So our good Samaritan is going to take all this research and the frameworks and they'll probably mix in some company processes, maybe establish some new ones. They're going to document it all together in their shiny new incident response plan. Now we're ready. We're ready for our next big incident. And that day will come, sooner or later. But don't worry, we have a playbook. And as we start working through the incident and working through our playbook, we're going to start to realize an incident response plan is kind of like this. <laughs> it tells you what to do, but incidents are inherently unpredictable and anomalous, and there's a lot of figuring out in between those steps. What seemed simple in theory suddenly gets messy and complicated. Each step is full of many tasks, and these tasks vary from incident to incident. They depend on your organizational and even sometimes external context and factors outside your control. You might think you've mitigated the impact only to find out that your investigation was flawed, your mitigation didn't work as intended, or maybe it even caused a whole new set of issues. Then there's the whole mess of communicating with everyone affected, your employees, your customers, your stakeholders. All these little logistical details that were overlooked in your plan slow or stall your progress entirely. Incidents feel simple, but in reality, the many of you who have been in them probably know they're a little more complex in practice. But that's okay. Uh, this is also where I get outed that I use ChatGPT to make these illustrations, because I know that that says retrosotive, and we're all just going to pretend it says retrospective. <laughs> so you're going to run one of those. You're going to run a retrospective. And incidents are full of unexpected learning opportunities, so each one is going to bring all of these learnings and challenges. And as diligent, good little retro runners, you're going to want to encode them and document them so your future responders can benefit. So into the playbook they go. But this is where something starts to happen. You handle more and more incidents. You encounter more and more unexpected, anomalous scenarios. Your playbooks become filled with more and more information about what worked or what you should do. And things get a little complicated again. Trying to do the right thing becomes less of an exercise in judgment and critical thinking and more of an exercise in following complicated instructions about what you're supposed to do. <coughs> Over time, that very thing that was supposed to bring clarity and confidence in your incident response becomes a source of confusion. Everything gets complicated. The many rules and policies start to take a toll on the mental load for responders. Ultimately, people become more worried about doing the thing right than doing the right thing. And the trust in those playbooks decreases. People might start or stop using them entirely. And this does not just affect your responders. This affects your response. Have you ever been affected by an incident where you received a communication or a response and you thought, are they even listening? What were they thinking? Whether it's maybe a confusing email that sounds just like a canned corporate statement to dodge liability, or a $10 Uber Eats gift card for the largest software outage in recent memory. When people are not empowered to do the right thing in earnest to help those affected, those outcomes ultimately damage trust between companies and their customers and stakeholders. And while I do identify as a bit of an eternal optimist, even after being in this line of work for nearly a decade, I do not believe that poor responses are actually a symptom of apathy on the part of the responders. Rigid policy that eliminates judgment erodes critical thinking skills. We need to create incident response practices that encourage and empower people to stay sharp, vigilant, and agile, and make decisions quickly with limited information. And don't worry, I'm not saying you need to go burn your incident response plan and throw it out the window. There's still a place for it. This is where you should document essential building blocks of your incident response program. Things like your severity levels, your roles, and all that good stuff that provides some structure. You might even need to have an incident response playbook to meet regulatory requirements like SOC 2. That's totally fine. And you can even document learnings from past incidents into these playbooks in a way that actually helps people. But what I'm cautioning against is attempting to turn incident-specific actions into policy without accounting for context. So what do we do? 
We want people to feel confident. We want our response to be consistent. We want it to improve over time. The question becomes, how do we build the right skills to get there? This is a mindset shift from, what's the process for this type of incident, to how do we make better decisions in unpredictable circumstances? Um, I don't actually have all the answers to that question, but I have a few ideas. Building confident and strategic incident responders takes a lot of things. It's a mix of the right cultures, systems, tools, practices, and even people. But there are some tactics and strategies that I can give you to create structure at the right level while still leaving room for people to make real-time judgment calls and use their critical thinking, and I believe that that ultimately does lead to a better response. So, let's get into those. I'm gonna share some strategies to create some more consistency, but again, still flexibility. And these are the ones that we're gonna talk about. So we have automation, all about getting those repetitive but cognitively draining manual tasks out of the way so that your responders actually have the bandwidth to apply critical thinking and to think deeply about the problems that require it. Next is heuristics. These are mental shortcuts based on perceived and broadly applicable truths that you can establish as an organization. And I know, uh, I have examples, don't worry. And finally, there's tripwires. These create clear checkpoints or boundaries because too much ambiguity can actually also be a blocker. To make great decisions, people need context and a frame of reference to base them on. So let's look at some examples of what these tactics look like in action. This is a room full of DevOps people in 2024. I don't need to explain automation to you. Um, other to say that automation in incident response specifically is a lifesaver, even essential. I once worked at a company that had an entire playbook written specifically for executive communication paths and who should be informed in what circumstances and how. This executive always wants to know if this service is down. This one wants a text. This one wants an email in a very specific format. It's madness. <laughs> you're trying to fix a complex problem under pressure and you're devoting that much time to just reading and interpreting how all of your executives want to be informed about it. These tasks are so easily automatable, automated <laughs> in 2024. And if you're not automating these manual administrative tasks, I really believe you're setting your incident responders up to fail. So here's an example of the type of things that I recommend automating. Executive escalation paths are one of them. Your internal communication, pushing updates internally to different Slack channels, reminding people to update the status page, just getting the right people in the room and tracking the tasks that come out of your meetings, your Slack channel, your Teams group, whatever it is. Next, we have heuristics, and these get a little more complicated. These also are an entire concept and have a whole life outside of incident response, but this is the closest way I could find to illustrate this approach, so bear with me, we'll go through some examples. A heuristic technique, though, it's an approach to problem solving that, imply, that employs a pragmatic method that's essentially good enough to make a quick judgment call with limited information. So here's an example that you could use in an incident. Assume the worst. When you're faced with a tough decision, which you will be, a heuristic like this can help you quickly make a decision. It's like a mental model, but it's a little more specific to your organization and how you want to approach things. A heuristic like this would apply well at a large company, maybe they're publicly traded, or they deal with a sensitive customer base where they need to be highly risk averse. At a startup, you might go the opposite way. This might not work for your approach. You might bias more towards action and iteration. So you want to establish the frame of mind that you want your responders to be in. Here's another one that's more tangible too. Imagine you have an incident where a forced failover could restore service, but it carries a high risk of data loss. You could perform a lower risk remediation, but you'd probably extend the downtime. Imagine the pressure of making that call, not knowing what is the right move. This can be solved by establishing a heuristic ahead of time. In this example, the company's policy is to protect data at all cost. They are willing to extend downtime if it guarantees data preservation. So it makes the answer for instant responders clear but simple at a very high level that can apply in a lot of different circumstances. Heuristics are imperfect. You don't want to use them for everything, but there are cases where they can be really helpful. 
Decisions that must be made quickly with limited information. Certainty is impossible. And also things that are maybe more subjective. There's no right answer. It's gonna depend on your company values and priorities. Next we have tripwires. I like to explain tripwires with a question. Is the number 100 a lot or a little? Depends, right? 100 support interactions for an organization of 300 customers, that's a lot. For an organization of 2 million customers, it's a blip on the radar. Tripwires allow you to set triggers outside of live incidents. So you can keep a level head and make better decisions under pressure without the added pressure of you know, your support team saying, oh God, we're really busy. We need to email all customers. What does really busy look like? Establish that outside of the live incident, outside of the high pressure environment. This changes the conversation. Instead of, should we email all customers? It becomes, well, our tripwire to email all customers is if support load exceeds three times our regular volume. Should we make an exception here? Do we see a reason to? That's a whole different conversation. So here's some examples of what tripwires trip might look like in action. You, you're gonna use precedent, organizational context, and past incidents to inform these, and you can change them. You can also decide to make exceptions, and you very well might. But again, it reshapes the conversation from what should we do, which is so ambiguous, to should we make an exception? That's a different conversation that takes into account the unique context of the incident and leaving room for people to exercise judgment but still creating a bit of a guardrail and a frame of reference for the decision. And I wanna really stress that there is no substitute for culture. None of this works if you do not have a culture that enables and empowers incident responders. I have seen many well-intentioned organizations inadvertently create a culture of fear around incidents. And I hope to see that change, and I have already seen it change a lot as I've done this work. Incident response is scary but it's also fun and rewarding and important. And it's when what you stand for as an organization is really on display. So when you find people who are willing to step into that ring, you empower them to orchestrate thoughtful human responses and do the right thing, I think you'll be really surprised by the quality of response and the outcomes that you see. So that's all for me. Thank you so much. Um, if you do wanna talk incident response culture practices, come find me, I'll be here. Awesome.